Hello, I'm Irma Baker. Welcome to our show. You know, we all make decisions, decisions, decisions. Some are easy, some are hard. But our guests today are going to help us work our way through one of the hard ones. We'll meet them right after these words from our sponsor. RSVP of Summit County has been making a difference in our community since 1972. RSVP volunteers are increasing the quality of life by participating in programs and organizations that provide important services to the community. RSVP matches personal interests and skills with opportunities to serve. If you're interested in adding more meaning to your life and improving the lives of others, please call 330-253-4597, extension 166. Welcome back. Our guests today are Tom Williams, who is a community liaison, and Kim Davis, the case manager for All Caring Hospice. Certainly a very serious and sobering topic, but one that somewhere all of us will face during our lifetimes. So Kim and Tom, welcome uh, to, uh, to our show. It's so great to have you with us. Irma, thank you so much for having us. It's our honor and pleasure to be here, as you said, to talk about this most intimate uh, form of decision making. It certainly is. And I was very pleased, if that's the right word, to see in the backgrounds of both of you that not only are you representing a company that provides hospice care, but both of you have had to deal with hospice care in your own personal lives. Um, Tom, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? Um, I'm a retired bank CEO, and after 40 plus years in financial services, 14 years ago, I made the decision to enter healthcare, and I became a licensed nursing home administrator. And through that path and that journey in my second career, I had the opportunity to work with a number of hospice companies. And about a year and a half or so ago, I decided to, my experience led me to believe that hospice is the most intimate part of the post-acute care system and I just wanted to join and be part of that journey and I found All Caring Hospice and came to me from our medical director that was my medical director and he highly recommended it. I interviewed and here I am and could be more pleased. Kim, my colleague, also has an interesting journey and she has been the author of a lot of the things I do right and will refuse to admit that she's the author of anything that I do wrong. <laughs> Kim, tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, I've been a registered nurse for about 30 years. I uh, spent most of my time in, uh, spent a great deal of time in long-term care. Um, during the mid-90s, uh, my husband and I uh, were in the Samoan Islands in the South Pacific and started a Baptist church and while there I also uh, worked in the hospital there um, then came back went into long-term care again and then um, decided that hospice was more of what um, I wanted to try tried it in that was 12 years ago and and haven't looked back um, been very happy with the decision and so and you and your husband both had to deal with uh hospice care? Yeah, it was, it was actually my husband's parents. Uh, his mother uh, had uh, respiratory issues and then some dementia in addition to that at the, towards the end. And then his, uh, his father had cancer. And so uh, we journeyed with them um, through hospice uh, for the last months of their lives. And uh, we found that it was, you know, um, hospice was able to give us support uh, while my mother-in-law was alive, my father-in-law was, you know, doing a lot of her caregiving and the hospice was able to, to give him a lot of support as well. And so, um, so yeah, I've definitely seen, you know, been on the giving as well as the receiving end of the, of the service. And, and, you know, we look at hospice being something that uh, a lot of people think, well, when you put somebody on hospice, you're giving up but it really is a change in the direction of, your, of what you're doing and trying to maximize the, you know, what you have. You know, sometimes, sometimes people, you know, are so aggressive that 
they can enjoy the last few months that they have. Tom, what about you? You've had some personal experience with hospice as well. We have my wife, Liz, is a nurse, and currently Kim is actually assisting us. We're caring for her mother, who's a retired registered nurse from St. Vincent Charity Hospital after 35 years, and she has end-stage dementia. We're caring for her in our home. And the complexities for all of us who are in healthcare uh, are, are, it's like a tsunami. And so one of the things and one of the passions that both Kim and I have is to be there to support help making those decisions. And so we've relied a lot on Kim and our medical directors, Dr. Shoba Kandwal and Medina, to help walk us through this difficult journey. And it's those days, it's, uh, it's very difficult, and there are some days when you need a lot of support, and the people that we work with, like Kim, have made themselves available 24-7, and that's part of what we do. We're experiencing it right now as, uh, as we're talking. Well, let's get right to the heart of it. What is hospice? Hospice has dates back to the medieval times. It's, the root comes from uh, hospitality, and it was first introduced. I'm going to go to some pencil <laughs> notes so I can make this brief. To 1948, when uh, a physician by the name of Dean uh, Cecily Saunders started the first hospice in 1948. It was St. Christopher's Hospice. Uh, she introduced it then to the United States in 1963 at Yale University. In 1969, we are, many of us are familiar with Dr. Elizabeth Kuba Ross, wrote the first major textbook and major selling book uh, on death and dying. And she introduced the concepts not only of hospice, the care of the family, as well as what we do, as well as bereavement and going through the decision process. And in 1974, the Connecticut Hospice was founded in Brantford, Connecticut. In 1978, the Department of Health and Human Services officially recognizes hospice uh, as part of the interdisciplinary care approach in the post-acute care system. And then also the Department of Health and Services uh, in 1979 uh, through the Health Care Financing Act actually began funding hospice uh, through Medicare and now through Medicaid. The two primary care uh, uh, sources of payment for the care will be Medicare and Medicaid, although there are some private insurances that also provide uh, opportunities for hospice care. Well, when we talk about hospice, who can really benefit from hospice? Well, of course we'll start with the patient, but it's also the patient's family and friends. So there are six primary areas of diagnoses, and the first requirement is there that a physician will write an order for hospice that indicates that that physician believes with their clinical judgment that the patient is six months or less before they're going to pass away. That's the main first criteria. Um, by the way, CMS, Centers for Medicare, Medicaid Services, did a study in 2015, and as Kim alluded, a hospice is not a death sentence. They found that out of a huge sample, I think maybe almost 600,000, following those six primary diagnoses, that people on hospice, not only did they have a higher quality of life based on the survey questions, but they lived an extra 15 days longer. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot that goes into that. Are you seeking aggressive care for geoblastoma, for instance, that uh, Senator McCain has? Or are there other options that you're going to maybe not go through and pursue anymore? Um, my son-in-law is well-experienced neurosurgeon, and I believe, Kim, uh, we've talked about this, we would agree, sometimes you get into the hospital system, there are so many different experts and specialists looking at you that the patient and the best interests mm -hmm. get lost. Mm -hmm. So we try to put that all together and to make the assistance. So um, the patient definitely um, and the patient's family are the main beneficiaries of hospice. Are there certain diagnoses that are more typically in need of hospice? There are, and I think we have a slide on the six main diagnoses. Well, yeah, that's a very elaborate one, but basically we're going to have Parkinson's, we're going to have cancer, COPD, which is a pulmonary respiratory disease. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to have cardiac diagnoses, CHF, which is cardiac heart failure, and liver diseases. Uh, one of the more prominent is going to be an end-stage dementia, uh, Alzheimer's or Lewy Bonnie's disease. Um, Kim, would you like to add to those? Um, I think that's a pretty 
uh, good list as far as you know a general list. Um, you know, sometimes it's a, it's a combination of things. Um, sometimes you have um, elder, you know, especially as people become uh, elderly and they have, you know, a number of different things wrong with them. Uh, sometimes it's, if they had just the one thing wrong with them, it, that would not take their life, but having that in con conjunction with other things um, can speed up the, the speed of their passing. Um, so sometimes we have things uh, that we call comorbidities, which is a fancy word for things that you have wrong with you in addition to the main thing that we're taking care of you for. Um, and so those combination of things can sometimes be uh, a problem uh, for some of our patients. We frequently see that with our patients is, is having, uh, and you get into a mixed uh, bag with with medications and symptom control when, um, when they have a lot of different diagnosis that you're trying to manage. Um, you might have somebody who has, uh, for instance, congestive heart failure and they've got all this fluid and you're trying to get the, get, give them uh, medications to get the fluid off, but they have renal failure so you don't want to tax the kidneys too hard so then you're limited. In. So sometimes um, we do a lot with symptom management to make the patient comfortable. Uh, you know, I frequently will tell my patients when I meet them that my two biggest goals is to keep them comfortable and out of the hospital. And so, uh, and a lot of patients, that's a very comforting thing, especially um, if you have patients who have been with the revolving door in the emergency room, uh, which a lot of our patients, you know, will get them and they've been, in the hospital three or four times in the last six months. And you know, that, that's hard and if you have somebody who has any form of dementia, whether that's their primary diagnosis or a secondary diagnosis, that going from home to a, to a hospital and then maybe to a nursing home for rehab and then back home, all of the, that movement, it can really work on, on, on their- Set on their them back. And you know, and even just on, you know, on, on a, on a person who's otherwise healthy, um, just that going back and forth to the hospital is, is very draining. And so, and we do see that a lot with our patients is they've had these multiple trips to the hospital and they're, they're really tired. And so, so a lot of times they're, they're glad to hear that that part is, you know, is over. And Medicare has actually seen this as a tremendous advantage as well, not only to lowering the costs of the end stage of somebody's life, but also for the quality of life. And again, those studies indicated that anytime you would change the environment, so we care for patients in the home, we care for them in skilled nursing facilities, assisted livings, and if we can limit the changes, whether you need to go back to the hospital or the care providers change, if you keep shifting the care providers, particularly if somebody has some dementia, it sets people back and it can exacerbate a condition and a quality of life for not only the patient, but the family and loved ones who are caring for them. And if they're in a skilled nursing facility or an assisted living, that's part of their family too. Those caregivers there are also part of their family. Well, it sounds to me like there are actually levels of care that you're providing. What are those levels? How do, you, how do you decide what is the kind of care that people need? Well, our first level is a comprehensive level. Well, um, there, there is different levels of care uh, within Medicare guidelines. Um, and routine is what most, most patients are, which is intermediate visits uh, during the week. Um, and then, you know, and on-call uh, needed visits as necessary. Um, then you have, um, if patients have uh, symptoms that cannot be controlled, um, then um, they can be uh, inpatient, sometimes even in a, uh, in a hospital or uh, some places have like a hospice facility. Our company does not. Uh, we take care of place, people where they're at. Um, but sometimes uh, people will go to a place like that um, and then um, you 
will have that. And then sometimes we have respite where that we have a patient who's being taken care of at home by the family and then um, Medicare gives an allowance of um, five days every quarter that a family can have their loved one go to a nursing home so that they can have a break from that caregiving. Um, you know, we, we had a patient where that um, the daughter was her primary caregiver and um, for her, she wanted to go out of town, but she couldn't, you know, her mom was not well enough to go out of town. So she was able to use the respite to, uh, as a way for her mom to be taken care of. And yet she was able to go and, and get some rest and, and recoup herself. And so, um, so there is those different levels of care. I'd like um, to expand just a little bit. Um, Kim mentioned hospice house or a place for hospice. And she also mentioned that we care for in place. So in this case, for instance, if someone's in a skilled nursing facility and they have that need for that extra care, we've actually contracted with the skilled nursing facility. We increase our visitations with our case managers, our medical director will make a visit. Um, what that accomplishes is that patient doesn't have to be moved. They get to see the caregivers in the skilled nursing facility. Their family members are usually more comfortable there. If they're at home, then as we would do with the rest, but they would go to one of our contracted facilities. And again, the family's close by, and that facility is going to be very educated and very well tuned on how to manage that process. And they do so in a more of a home-like environment. You are uh, approaching a question that came to mind when I was listening to you, Kim, and that is uh, the idea of a nursing facility or some healthcare facility actually taking somebody for only five days. Is that uh, something common? It, it seems we, like we there's have such a waiting list, but it is, it it's is. your contacts with those organizations? Mm -hmm. we, do, we have contracts with a number of facilities. We serve, uh, with our company, we serve the most western part would be Lorain County, the most southern part probably Stark County, so all of the northeastern part of the state of Ohio we cover. And in those areas we have contracted facilities and it's based on their bed availability, mm -hmm. but because of the care and our reputation, uh, they will normally make a, um, a room available and a bed available for a respite stay. Mm, that's a wonderful opportunity to have there. And, and of course, from that wide area, you're also serving Medina County and mm -hmm. Summit County. Exactly. So our entire area, that's yes. just mm -hmm. our viewing area. So, oh, that, that is, I'm sure that's comforting to the caregivers as well as to the patient. Yeah, it, it is because sometimes you'll have, when you have a patient who is, who's at home and who's alert and oriented, but who has, um, a large demand because of how sick they are. Um, they will feel bad about, you know, the drain they are to their family and the hardships that they are causing to their family. So it can be encouraging to the patient because, okay, I'm going to be, you know, away from home for a few days, but, you know, my daughter, my wife will be able to go out of state and visit the grandkids. We'll be able to, um, you know, what, whatever for a few days just to rest and, you know, um, I've had cases in the past where that, because um, when you're dealing with elderly, if you have an elderly couple and, you know, one is taking care of the other one, if one of them, ha if the caregiver has health problems, then that's where the respite can come in as well as sometimes, you know, say the caregiver needs to have cataract surgery you know, it's kind of hard to do when or you're the primary, e or they get, the, you know, those kind of things. So that's where the respite can, can be very helpful to, to families. And well, so. all of this information is building a good resource uh, for people in coming to the decision of when should you really consider hospice care? The dialogue in the ideal setting would begin with a physician. In fact, there were some new benefits provided by Medicare that would incent uh, a physician to have end-of-life planning. So I go through it with my physician, do I have a living will, um, and go through my advanced directives. Part of that can easily be a hospice conversation as well if someone is facing a terminal diagnosis. Unfortunately, physicians have yet to be schooled 
And I think to a person, they will let you know that Hippocratic Oath is very important to them. They are going to treat and they're going to cure. And it's a very difficult decision for the physician, which makes it even more difficult for the family. You know, that's a very interesting concept. Never <clears throat> thought of that, what it means to a physician to have to say there's nothing more I can do. It, it for, is a lot of for a lot of physicians, it's a, it's a fear, or a sense of failure because that, um, you know, it's been ingrained, you know, through all their education to cure, cure, cure. And so to say, I can't do anything anymore is to, I, I think that for a lot of physicians, it's, it, it's hard for them to accept the fact that death is a part of living that we we see we see we see death as being something that's coming and it's how are we going to deal with it and, and you know and I, I think that that's where that the discussion is good that's where people can have a discussion with their families um, because what one of the things that I use when I'm talking to families is that when they do surveys and they ask how do you want to die if people, if people, and you take away the, I want to have a massive heart attack and be gone in a second and not have to worry about it. If you take away that, then people are, and you give them the option of being at home with their family around them, or whatever their home is, whether it be a nursing facility or assisted living or their own home, or to be in the hospital hooked up to monitors and beepers and, and only have their family be able to come in for 10 minutes every four hours. Um, most of those people are going to say, I want to be home. I might add, too, about the caregivers. As I said earlier, my wife and I are actually living this right now with her mother. Her mother has those moments where she remembers being an RN and is very vocal about what her wishes are. Uh, she prefers, like 65% of the most seniors, to die at home. She prefers to be surrounded by her family. She is caring about our burden. Uh, we both hold down full-time careers. Unfortunately, my wife works at night, I work during the day, but we care about caregiver burnout, and she does too. She's a very compassionate woman, has been her entire life. But the caregivers also need that support, and so assisting in making the decision, I like to spend a lot of time with the family members, even when they just begin to contemplate hospice. It's such an intimate, we could talk about demographics, socioeconomic, faith, etc. regardless, when it gets right down to it, is that one situation where that conversation is held, and I would say 90% of the time, afterwards, there's a sense of relief mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. for the caregivers. Yeah, and we, you know, we have a whole team that's that's involved too. It's not just the nurse. There, there's a nurse. There's a nursing assistant. Um, there is a chaplain if the family, you know, wishes, and uh, and also a social worker. So, so these are to help not only the patient through the journey, but the family through the journey because. The, the patient is going through this journey of, of loss of, of function and not being able to do the things that they want to do and the frustration that comes along with that. But the, the family is, is going through the, the thought that this is my, this is my wife of, of, of 65 years and I'm going to be losing her. This is, this is my, this is my husband that I woke up next to for, for 60 years and now he doesn't know my name. Um, these are, you know, things, that, and we also try to help get them resources, you know, on things, different disease processes, mm -hmm. because those different diseases can affect people differently at end of life and try to help them through that journey. Well, like we've got uh, just about a, a minute or two left. This. <laughs> um, our time has just flown today, it really has. So uh, let's deal quickly with one of the big challenges, fears, frustrations, and that is how do you pay for it? I was just going to mention the financial aspects of it. This is the one benefit that Medicare provides that has no limitation. The number of days, and they believe, as do we, that's such an important benefit that Medicare will fund as many days as a patient needs and their caregivers need. Uh, to have a quality end of life. So Medicare is a primary, Medicaid as well, uh, and I would say that the vast majority of individuals will have a form of Medicare regardless of their age, 
uh, probably sometimes because if you have Parkinson's disease or leukemia, then you automatically qualify for Medicare and the Social Security. Income. And some private insurances will have uh, an allowance for so many days for, for hospice. So people should check into what their insurance coverage is. They should, uh, would they contact you uh, yes. to say, can you help me through the Medicare Medicaid process? They can contact us and we can verify whether or not they have coverage and then, you know, and see whether or not that's, uh, whether it works out that way or not. And I personally work because of my experience as a licensed nursing home administrator as a banker. I work with the families many times to assist in the process and it, we get the resources. One way or another we'll network and get the resources to get their answers. It's not a fearful thing. We can make it happen. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. I think that you have answered some of the very hard questions that so many of us, uh, of us have, whether personally or as caregivers. So thank you so much for being with us, and thank you so much for watching our show today. We hope it's been helpful to you, and please do have a wonderful day and come back and visit us again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irma. Since 1971, RSVP has been matching volunteers' talents to community needs. RSVP is affiliated with the Corporation for National and Community Service, a national organization that supports service and volunteering through grant-funded projects. Volunteers organize neighborhood watch programs, tutor children, renovate homes, plant community gardens, assist victims of natural disasters, and serve their communities in many other ways. RSVP offers maximum flexibility and choice to its volunteers as it matches the personal interests and skills of Americans 55 and older with opportunities to serve their communities. If you're interested in adding more meaning to your life and improving the lives of others, please call 330-253-4597, extension 166.